Book One, Chapter Two of Letters of Travel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tim Bulkley of BigBible.org. From Tideway to Tideway, 1892 to 95. Across a Continent. From Letters of Travel by Rudyard Kipling. It is not easy to escape from a big city. An entire continent was waiting to be traversed, and for that reason we lingered in New York till the city felt so homelike that it seemed wrong to leave it. And further, the more one studied it, the more grotesquely bad it grew. Bad in its paving, bad in its streets, bad in its street police, and but for the kindness of the tides would be worse than bad in its sanitary arrangements. No one has yet approached the management of New York in a proper spirit. That is to say, regarding it as the shiftless outcome of squalid barbarism and reckless extravagance. No one is likely to do so, because reflections on the long, narrow pig trough are construed as malevolent attacks against the spirit and majesty of the great American people and lead to angry comparisons. Yet if all the streets of London were permanently up, and all the lamps permanently down, this would not prevent the New York streets, taken in a lump, from being first cousins to a Zanzibar foreshore, or kin to the approaches of a Zulu kraal. Gullies, holes, ruts, cobblestones awry, curbstones rising from two to six inches above the level of the slatternly pavement, tram lines from two to three inches above street level, building materials scattered half across the street, lime, boards, cut stone and ash barrels, generally and generously everywhere, wheel traffic taking its chances, Dray versus Brougham at crossroads, sway-backed poles whittled and unpainted, drunken lamp posts with twisted irons, and lastly, a generous scatter of filth, and more mixed stinks than the winter wind can carry away, are matters which can be considered quite apart from the spirit of democracy or the future of this great and growing country. In any other land they will be held to represent slovenliness, sordidness and want of capacity. Here it is explained, not once but many times, that they show the speed at which the city has grown and the enviable indifference of her citizens to matters of detail. One of these days you're told everything will be taken in hand and put straight. The unvirtuous rulers of the city will be swept away by a cyclone or a tornado or something big and booming of popular indignation. Everybody will unanimously elect the right men who will justly earn the enormous salaries that are at present being paid to inadequate aliens for road sweepings and all will be well. At the same time the lawlessness ingrained by governors among the governed during the last 30, 40 or it may be 50 years the brutal levity of the public conscience in regard to public duty, the toughening and suppling of public morals, and the reckless disregard for human life, bred by impotent laws and fostered by familiarity with needless accidents and criminal neglect, will miraculously disappear. If the laws of cause and effect that control even the freest people in the world say otherwise, so much the worse for the laws, America makes her own behind her stands the ghost of the most bloody war of the century caused in a peaceful land by long temporizing with lawlessness by letting things slide by shiftlessness and blind disregard for all save the need of the hour till the hour long conceived and let alone stood up full armed and men said here is an unforeseen crisis and killed each other in the name of God for four years in a heathen land, the three things that are supposed to be the pillars of moderately decent government are regard for human life, justice, criminal and civil, as far as it lies in man to do justice, and good roads. In this Christian city, they think lightly of the first, their own papers, their own speech, and their own actions prove it, buy and sell the second at a price openly and without shame and are apparently content to do without the third. One would almost expect 
racial sense of humour would stay them from expecting any praise. Slab, lavish and slavish from the stranger within their gates. But they do not. If he holds his peace, they forge tributes to their own excellence, which they put into his mouth, thereby treating their own land, which they profess to honour, as a quack treats his pills. If he speaks, but you shall see for yourself what happens then, and they cannot see that by untruth and invective it is themselves alone that they injure. The blame of their city evils is not altogether with the gentlemen, chiefly of foreign extraction, who control the city. These find a people made to their hand, a lawless breed ready to wink at one evasion of the law if they themselves may profit by another, and in their rare leisure hours content to smile over the details of a clever fraud. Then, says the cultured American, give us time, give us time, we shall arrive. And the otherwise American, who is aggressive, straightway proceeds to thrust a piece of half-hanged municipal botchwork under the nose of the alien as a sample of perfected effort. There is nothing more delightful than to sit for a strictly limited time with a child who tells you what he means to do when he's a man. But when that same child, loud-voiced, insistent, unblushingly eager for praise, but thin-skinned as the most morbid of hobbledehoys, stands about all your ways, telling you the same story in the same voice, you begin to yearn for something made and finished, say, Egypt and a completely dead mummy. It is neither seemly nor safe to hint that the government of the largest city in the States is a despotism of the alien by the alien for the alien, tempered with occasional insurrections of the decent folk. Only the Chinaman washes the dirty linen of other lands. St. Paul, Minnesota Yes, it is very good to get away once more and pick up the old and ever fresh business of the vagrant loafing through new towns. Learned in the manner of dogs, babies and perambulators half the world over and tracking the seasons by the upgrowth of flowers in stranger people's gardens. St. Paul standing at the barn door of the Dakota and Minnesota granaries is all things to all men except to Minneapolis eleven miles away whom she hates and by whom she is patronized. She calls herself the capital of the Northwest, the New Northwest, and her citizens wear not only the tall silk hat of trade, but the soft slouch of the West. She talks in another tongue than the New Yorker, and, sure sign that we are far across the continent, her papers argue with the San Francisco ones over rate wars and the competition of railway companies. St. Paul has been established for many years and if one were reckless enough to go down to the business quarters one would hear all about her and more also but the residential parts of the town are the crown of it in common with scores of other cities broad crowned suburbs using the word in the English sense that make the stranger jealous you get here what you do not get in the city well paved or asphalted roads planted with trees and trim sidewalks studded with houses of individuality not boorishly fenced off from each other but standing each on its own plot of well-kept turf running down to the pavement it is always Sunday in these streets of a morning the cable car has taken the men downtown to business the children are at school and the big dogs three and a third to each absent child lie nosing the winter killed grass and wondering when the shoots will make it possible for a gentleman to take his spring medicine in the afternoon children on tricycles stagger up and down the asphalt with due proportion of big dogs at each wheel. The cable cars coming uphill begin to drop the men each at his own door, the door of the house that he builded for himself, though the architect incited him to that vile little attic tower and useless loggia. And naturally enough twilight brings the lovers walking two by two along the very quiet ways. You can tell from the houses almost the exact period at which they were built whether in the jigsaw days when it behoved respectability to use unlovely turned rails and pierced gable ends or 
during the colonial craze which means white paint and fluted pillars or in the latest domestic era a most pleasant mixture that is of stained shingles, hooded dormer windows, cunning verandas and recessed doors. Seeing these things one begins to understand why the Americans visiting England are impressed with the old and not with the new. He is not much more than a hundred years ahead of the English in design, comfort and economy and, this is most important, labour saving appliances in his house. From Newport to San Diego you will find the same thing today. Last tribute of respect and admiration. One little brown house at the end of an avenue is shuttered down and the doctor's buggy stands before it. On the door a large blue and white label says Scarlet Fever. Oh, most excellent municipality of St. Paul. It is because of these little things and not by rowdying and racketing in public places that a nation becomes great and free and honoured. In the cars tonight they will be talking wheat, girdling at Minneapolis and sneering at Duluth's demand for twenty feet of water from Duluth to the Atlantic. Matters of no great moment compared with those streets and that label. A day later. Five days ago there wasn't a foot of earth to see it was just naturally covered with snow says the conductor standing in the rear car of the great northern train he speaks as though the snow had hidden something priceless here is the view one railway track and a line of staggering telegraph poles ending in a dot and a blur on the horizon to the left and right a sweep as it were of the sea one huge plain of cornland waiting for the spring dotted at rare intervals with wooden farmhouses patent self reapers and binders almost as big as the houses ricks left over from last year's abundant harvest and bottled here and there with black patches to show that the early ploughing had begun the snow lies in a last few streaks and whirls by the track from skyline to skyline is black loam and prairie grass so dead that it seems as though no one year's sun could waken it this is the granary of the land where the farmer who bears the burden of the state and who therefore ascribes last year's bumper crop to the direct action of the McKinley bill has also to bear the ghastly monotony of earth and sky he keeps his head having many things to attend to but his wife sometimes goes mad as the women do in Vermont there is little variety in nature's big wheat field they say that when the corn is in the ear the wind, chasing shadows across it for miles and miles, breeds as it were a vertigo in those who must look and cannot turn their eyes away. And they tell a nightmare story of a woman who lived with her husband for fourteen years at an army post in just such a land as this. Then they were transferred to West Point, among the hills over the Hudson, and she came to New York. But the terror of the tall houses grew upon her and grew, till she went down with brain fever and the dread of her delirium was that the terrible things would topple down and crush her. That is a true story. They work for harvest with steam ploughs here. How could mere horses face the endless furrows? And they attack the earth with toothed, cogged and spiked engines that would be monstrous in the shops, but here only speckles on the yellow grass even the locomotive is cowed a train of freight cars is passing along a line that comes out of the blue and goes on till it meets the blue again elsewhere the train would move off with a joyous vibrant roar here it steals away down the vista of the telegraph poles with an awed whisper steals away and sinks into the soil then comes a town deep in black mud, a straggly inch thick plank town with dull red grain elevators. The open country refuses to be subdued even for a few score rods. Each street ends in the illimitable open and it is as though the whole houseless outside earth were racing through it. Towards evening under a grey sky 
flies up an unframed picture of desolation. In the foreground, a farm wagon almost axle deep in mud, the mire dripping from the slow turning wheels as the man flogs the horses. Behind him, on a knoll of sodden, soggy grass, fenced off by raw rails from the landscape at large, are a knot of utterly uninterested citizens who have flogged horses and raised wheat in their time, but today lie under chipped and weather worn wooden headstones. Surely, burial here must be more awful to the newly made ghost than burial at sea. There's more snow as we go north, and nature is hard at work breaking up the ground for the spring. The thaw has filled every depression with a sullen grey-black spate, and out of the levels the water lies six inches deep, in stretch upon stretch as far as the eye can reach. Every culvert is full, and the broken ice clinks against the wooden pier guards of the bridges. Somewhere in this flatness there is a refreshing jingle of spurs among the cars, and a man of the Canadian Mounted Police swaggers through with his black fur cap and the yellow tab aside. His well-fitting overalls and his better set-up back. One wants to shake hands with him because he is clean and does not slouch nor spit, trims his hair and walks as a man should. Then a custom house officer wants to know too much about cigars, whiskey and Florida water. Her Majesty the Queen of England and Empress of India has us in her keeping. Nothing has happened to the landscape, and Winnipeg, which is, as it were, a centre of distribution for emigrants, stands up to her knees in the water of the thaw. The year has turned in earnest, and somebody is talking about the first ice shove at Montreal, 1,300 or 1,400 miles east. They will not run trains on Sunday at Montreal, and this is Wednesday. Therefore the Canadian Pacific makes up a train for Vancouver at Winnipeg. This is worth remembering because few people travel in that train and you escape any rush of tourists running westward to catch the Yokohama boat. The car is your own and with it the service of the porter. Our porter, seeing things were slack, beguiled himself with a guitar which gave a triumphal and festive touch to the journey, ridiculously out of keeping with the view. For eight and twenty long hours did the bored locomotive trail us through a flat and hairy land powdered, ribbed and speckled with snow small snow that drives like dust shot in the wind the land of Assiniboia now and again for no obvious reason to the outside mind there was a town then the towns gave place to section so and so then there were trails of the buffalo where he once walked in his pride then there was a mound of white bones supposed to belong to the said buffalo and then the wilderness took up the tale some of it was good ground but most of it seemed to have fallen by the wayside and the tedium of it was eternal at twilight an unearthly sort of twilight there came another curious picture thus a wooden town shut in among low treeless rolling ground a calling river that ran unseen between scarped banks barracks of a detachment of mounted police a little cemetery where ex-troopers rested a painfully formal public garden with pebble paths and foot-high fir trees a few lines of railway buildings white women walking up and down the street in the bitter cold with their bonnets off some Indians in red blanketing with buffalo horns for sale trailing along the platform and not ten yards from the track a cinnamon bear and a young grizzly standing up with extended arms in their pens and begging for food. It was strange beyond anything that this bald telling can suggest, opening a door to a new world. The only commonplace thing about the spot was its name, Medicine Hat, which struck me instantly as the only possible name such a town could carry. This is that place which later became a town, but I had seen it three years before when it was even smaller and was reached by me in a freight car, ticket unpaid for. That next morning brought us the Canadian Pacific Railway as one reads about it. No pen of man could do justice to the scenery there. The guide books struggled desperately with descriptions, adapted for summer reading, of rushing cascades, lichened rocks, waving pines and snow-capped mountains. But in April these things are not there. The place is locked up, dead as a frozen corpse. 
the mountain torrent is a boss of palest emerald ice against a, the dazzle of the snow pine stumps are capped and hooded with gigantic mushrooms of snow the rocks are overlaid five feet deep the rocks, the fallen trees and the lichens together and the dumb white lips curl up to the track cut in the side of the mountain and grin there fanged with gigantic icicles you may listen in vain when the train stops for the least sign of breath or power among the hills the snow has smothered the rivers and the great looping trestles run over what might be a lather of suds in a huge wash tub the old snow nearby is blackened and smirched with the smoke of locomotives and its dullness is grateful to aching eyes but the men who live upon the line have no consideration for these things at a halting place in a gigantic gorge walled in by the snows one of them reels from a tiny saloon into the middle of the track where half a dozen dogs are chasing a pig off the metals he is beautifully and eloquently drunk he sings, waves his hands and collapses behind a shunting engine while four of the loveliest peaks that the Almighty ever moulded look down upon him the landslide that should have wiped that saloon into kindlings has missed its mark and struck a few miles down the line one of the hillsides moved a little in dreaming of the spring and caught a passing freight train our cars grind cautiously by for the wrecking engine has only just come through the deceased engine is standing on its head in soft earth thirty or forty feet down the slide and two long cars loaded with shingles are dropped carelessly atop of it it looks so marvellously like a toy train flung aside by a child that one cannot realize what it means till a voice cries anyone killed? the answer comes back no, all jumped and you perceive with a sense of personal insult that this slovenliness of the mountain is an affair which may touch your own sacred self in which case but the train is out on a trestle into a tunnel and out on a trestle again it was here that everyone began to despair of the line when it was under construction because there seemed to be no outlet but a man came as a man always will and put a descent thus and a curve in this manner and a trestle so and behold the line went on it is in this place that we heard the story of the Canadian Pacific Railway told as men tell a many times repeated tale with exaggerations and omissions but an imposing tale nonetheless in the beginning when they would federate the Dominion of Canada it was British Columbia who saw objections to coming in and the Prime Minister of those days promised it for a bribe an iron band between tidewater and tidewater that should not break then everybody laughed which seems necessary to the health of most big enterprises and while they were laughing things were being done the Canadian Pacific Railway was given a bit of a line here and a bit of a line there and almost as much land as it wanted and the laughter was still going on when the last spike was driven between east and west at the very place where the drunken man sprawled behind the engine and the iron band ran from tideway to tideway as the premier said and people in England said how interesting and proceeded to talk about the plated army estimates incidentally the man who told us he had nothing to do with the Canadian Pacific Railway explained how it paid the line to encourage immigration and told of the arrival at Winnipeg of a trainload of Scotch crofters on a Sunday they wanted to stop then and there for the Sabbath they and all the little stock they had brought with them it was the Winnipeg agent who had to go among them arguing he was Scotch too and they could not quite understand it on the impropriety of dislocating the company's traffic so their own minister held a service in the station and the agent gave them a good dinner cheering them in Gaelic at which they wept and they went on to settle at Musomin where they lived happily ever afterwards of the manager the head of the line from Montreal to Vancouver our companion spoke with reverence that was almost awe that manager lived in a palace at Montreal but from time to time he would sally forth in his special car and whirl over his 3,000 miles at 50 miles an hour the regulation pace is 22 
but he sells his neck with his head. Few drivers cared for the honour of taking him over the road. A mysterious man he was, who carried the profile of the line in his head, and more than that, knew intimately the possibilities of back country, which he had never seen or travelled over. There is always one such man on every line. You can hear similar tales from drivers of, on the Great Western in England, or Eurasian station masters up the big northwestern in India. Then a fellow traveller spoke, as many others had done, on the possibilities of Canadian union with the United States. And his language was not the language of Mr. Goldwyn Smith. It was brutal in places. Summarized, it came to a pronounced objection to having anything to do with a land rotten before it was ripe, a land with seven million negroes as yet unwelded to, into the population, their race type unevolved, and rather more than crude notions on murder, marriage, and honesty. We've picked up their ways of politics, he said mournfully. That comes of living next door to them. But I don't think we're anxious to mix up with their other messes. They say they don't want us, they keep on saying it. There's a nigger on the fence somewhere, or they wouldn't lie about it. But does it follow they are lying? Sure, I've lived among them. They can't go straight. There's some damn fraud at the back of it. From this belief, he would not be shaken. He had lived among them. Perhaps he had been bested in trade. Let them keep themselves and their manners and customs to their own side of the line, he said. This is very sad and chilling. It seems quite otherwise in New York, where Canada was represented as a ripe plum ready to fall into Uncle Sam's mouth when he should open it. The Canadian has no special love for England. The mother of colonies has a wonderful gift for alienating the affections of her own household by neglect. But perhaps he loves his own country. We ran out of the snow through mile upon mile of snowsheds, braced with twelve-inch beams and planked with two-inch planking. In one place a snow slide had caught just the edge of a shed and scooped it away as a knife scoops cheese. High up the hills men had built diverting barriers to turn the drifts, but the drifts had swept over everything and lay five deep on the top of the sheds. When we woke it was on the banks of the muddy Fraser River and the spring was hurrying to meet us. The snow had gone, the pink blossoms of the wild current were open, the budding alders stood misty green against the blue-black of the pines, the brambles on the burnt stumps were in tenderest leaf, and every moss on every stone was this year's work, fresh from the hand of the maker. The land opened into clearings of soft black earth. At one station a hen had laid an egg and was telling the world about it. The world answered with a breath of real spring, spring that flooded the stuffy car and drove us out on the platform to snuff and sing and rejoice and pluck squashy green marsh flags and throw them at the colts and shout at the wild duck that rose from a jewel green lakelet. God be thanked that in travel one can follow the year. This my spring I lost last November in New Zealand. Now I shall hold her fast through Japan and the summer into New Zealand again. Here are the waters of the Pacific and Vancouver, completely destitute of any decent defences,